Hello everybody, thanks for joining us today and uh, for those of you who are watching the recorded session, uh, thanks for thanks for checking in. Uh, I just wanted to you know check on a couple of general housekeeping items today. I'm going to try and keep it short. I, uh, I just talked for about an hour in my History 10 class and I, I, I don't want to turn it into a, a lecture style ramble for, for you as well, but um, there are a couple things that I would like to address. Um, for those of you who have more or less kept up with our course calendar and have been using the resources uh, in order to crew, complete the assignments, thank you very much. I'm doing my best to get through them and, uh, and to give you hopefully some valuable feedback that you can use not just for future assignments but, uh, but also maybe for um, making revisions in the original work. So that's something I had talked about originally with the grade 10s. Nobody requested it or the history 10s. Nobody specifically requested it but it's generally been a, in a you know, bit of my teaching philosophy that yeah, you, if you're going to give a student um, you know, feedback, you should also offer them the opportunity to use that feedback to revise you know, their, their original thinking or the way that they approached uh, you know, a certain view or the evidence that they gave and give them a chance to improve it. So um, if there's any uh, assignments that you feel like maybe you didn't read the assignment carefully enough or you didn't put as much um, research into it or you didn't provide as much evidence as you think you should have uh, or you know if it's something from my feedback just kind of caught your eye and say oh yeah you know I'd like to go back and, and, and address that um, just let me know I think I'm going to go back and, and uh, for the assignments they maybe are set so they only take one attempt right now so I'm going to go back and, and look at those assignments and uh, I'm going to uh, enable multiple attempts a second attempt on on them um, so that if you do feel like uh, you can make significant improvements and you're willing to put the effort into making those changes and improving your uh, understanding or, or dealing with misconceptions or things like that, uh, lack of detail, yeah, absolutely. If you're willing to put the work into it, I'm willing to review it. Uh, my ability to reassess things that have already been marked once, it, it's not going to get as much, uh, it's not going to be as timely as, as things that are current. Obviously, I want to keep assessing things that students are handing in consistently and giving them feedback as we go. So, you know, you might find it takes me a little longer to mark something for a second time, a, a resubmission, but I, but I certainly will do it and I will adjust, uh, will adjust the mark for that. Um, I would never, I would never give you a lower mark than you had on the, on the, on the first attempt. So uh, rest assured, if you did work hard and make improvements, I would adjust those marks upward, of course. Note on the course calendar, um, again, some people have done a great job of sticking to the course calendar and uh, that's appreciated and hopefully you feel that by the you know as the semester goes on that that work that you've done in the early part of the class is paying off because you will have sufficient time in the last week or so of the quarter to get everything done and to do it to your usual high standard um, without being stressed out about all the all the little assignments that you didn't do earlier again the the, the, the calendar that i've made and the recommended sequence of events and due dates is more for you, um, well, certainly more for you than it is for me because it's you that you that you care about. It's your education and it's your goals and your academic uh, uh, goal set that, that, that we wanna help you achieve. Um, but it, the reason that we've got due dates and the reason we've got things scheduled as they are is because uh, you know I, we wanna be able to give you feedback along the way in regular intervals to help you improve your understanding and help you demonstrate your learning and make sure that you um, that you're getting out of the course what uh, what what you need to get out of the course and also so that you don't get uh, so you're not overburdened at the end of a quarter with you know 10 things to do and not nearly enough time to do it because as we know and I, I, I can be a, uh, I can be a, a procrastinator myself that's certainly something that I've experienced in my life if I have a calendar and I put things on a calendar I make a checklist of you know, things that need to be done on certain dates I'm much more likely to do them it may frustrate me at times so God, I had to do that. No, okay, this is really gonna suck to do it, but I'm but I'm gonna do it because I, I need to. Um, so if you're kind of like me in that regard, um, though it, it really does help to have that posted and just a pencil to knock things off the list when you get it done, uh, because really there's nothing worse than getting down to the last minute and realizing that you really could have done a much better job and you could have been, you know, more able to to clearly demonstrate your thoughts and articulate your arguments and back them up with evidence, but you just didn't have time. That's a very frustrating feeling. So that feeling and, uh, oh man, I don't know if I'm going to get enough done to pass. So then you get into a credit situation and that uh, adds all sorts of stress uh, stress and anxiety to you as well. So we really want, and to, my advice is um, if you feel like you're a bit behind right now, 
make some decisions. Um, you know, maybe sit down with your friends or your family or, or, you know, whoever you're willing to talk to about it and make some decisions. You know, what are my goals? Um, you know, I, I, am, am I going for a certain mark in this class? Am I going for a certain level of understanding? Am I just going for a credit and how am I going to get that credit? If you're going to make significant changes to the way that you approach this course and, uh, and, and you know, credit attainment and, and demonstrating your learning to me, now is the time. You don't want to leave it any later. We're already almost halfway through the course. So um, definitely, you know, people who feel like they're behind can, can, can do some good work to catch up and I'll certainly support you in any way I can. Uh, but you don't want to leave it any later than this or you're essentially you don't have much uh, much of a chance at a, at a credit in this course and nobody wants that right um, again you probably heard teachers say this before but it's it's don't do things for me it's not about me it's not about the class it's about your goals for yourself what do you um, what do you want to do uh, what are your goals for finishing school finishing the class what to do after school what to do for a career I mean nobody knows the answer to those questions or at least there's no expectation that you know the answers to those questions at this stage in your life, um, but but we do know that that uh, you know if you set some strong academic goals uh, and and a plan for your education, we know that you're going to be much more you're going to have much more flexibility in what you're able to do after school um, with regard to whatever you want to do with your life. You know whether whether you want to go and pursue second or post secondary education, or you want to pursue a, you know a certain employment path or trade or discovery or, or whatever it is you want to do. Um, we know that education can open doors and we do think it's important that every citizen uh it, you know every canadian citizen has at, at least basic understandings and learnings in essential areas i mean we try to expose you to each of uh, to each of the uh of these areas so that you know we, we exposure to, to learning and to knowledge and to situations um often tweaks things in people or, you know i never knew i was interested in that until i actually looked into it a little bit and i've got lots of those things in my life where if somebody hadn't uh, sort of pushed me to take a class or pushed me to try this or that and the other, I, I would never have discovered things that are very, very important to my life and my enjoyment. So I, I, it's a bit philosophical, but, uh, but the long and short of it is this, you know, the, this educational experience, this class, um, your approach is yours and set your goals and your teachers will, will certainly try to help you meet your goals and, and I want to support you any way I can. So if I can, um, if you have questions, if you're not understanding a concept, if there's some learning material that's not making sense to you, please, please do not hesitate to email me and we will try to either deal with it through email or we can schedule a one-on-one -on -one session or we can, uh, we can certainly address some of those things in these live sessions. I only ask that you try to be as, as clear and as targeted as possible about what it is that you're struggling with. Um, so instead of saying, I don't get anything from, from unit two, you know, saying, hey, I'm looking at assignment 2.1. Um, it asks us to do this or it asks this question. I'm not really sure what you mean by that. Or I went through a learning material and on slide 15, it says this and I don't really understand what it means. At least if you give me that very targeted information about what it is that you're uh, maybe a bit confused about or struggling with or want to generate some ideas about, we could be very, very efficient and proactive in helping you get through that, we being you and me. Um, whereas if it's sort of a general, I don't know what I'm doing kind of thing, there isn't really much for us to start with. So try to be specific and I will, I will bend over backwards to make sure that I get back to you quickly by email, try to help you, point you in the right direction if resources are available or discuss it or do what we need to do to help you on your way. If you're willing to make the effort to reach out to me and you've done your job as a student, you know, you've accessed the uh, information, you've read it over or watched it or done whatever you're supposed to do, you've read the assignment over carefully, the things that we, you know, logically consider to be the student's job. If you've done those things, and you're willing to, to put yourself out there and reach out to me and say, I'm, a little, I'm confused about this section right here or this question, I'm going to go out of my way to help you because I mean, you're, you're being a responsive student and I, and I want to do my best to support you and your goals. Okay, so that's kind of general thinking. The only other thing, uh, one of the things I mentioned to, in my earlier session today was, I was just talking, it's, it's a bit you know, philosophical with regard to education. My wife's also a teacher. We were just talking about the idea that um, you know, edutainment and how every subject and everything is supposed to be uh, you know, sort of perfectly sculpted for each individual student's interest area. And then I just, the reality of that is that whether you're talking about school or whether you're talking about the working world or whatever it is you do after school, the re there is a reality that you're not going to always enjoy the people that you work with. You're not always going to enjoy the people that uh, working with people that are in a group with you, whether in educational settings or at the workplace. You're not always going to enjoy certain subjects. 
And hopefully on the flip end, uh, flip side of that, you are going to have subjects that you're very interested in. You're going to have groups of people that you work really well with, and you, and you, and you know, you're going to have teachers that you connect very strongly with. So, you know, you've got two sides of the same experience, which we'll just, in this case, refer to as the world of high school education. And I think it is an important learning and growth um, milestone. And I don't want to I don't want to sound too, too negative here, but it is an important understanding with regard to growth that you're not always going to enjoy everything you do. You're not always going to enjoy the people that you work with. You're not always going to enjoy the classes that you're taking and might be, you know, sort of forced to take. Um, and that's a reality and you have to live with that, but you, all, you just keep in mind that those are, those tend to be temporary things. And once you, once you accept that, I may not always enjoy every concept or every class or every group that I'm in. Sometimes I'm just willing to do the things that I don't like very much in order to get to the things that I do like. And I think that's a really big part of development and learning and growing up is just accepting that um, it's a journey and there's going to be ups and there's going to be downs. There's going to be things you like, there's enjoy, uh, there's going to be things you don't enjoy, there's going to be things you enjoy immensely. And the goal is generally to shift your life, whether it be your education, your work, your friend group, your society, um, closer up the ladder to the things that you really find fulfilling and enjoyable in your life and make you a productive and happy citizen. Um, but sometimes you have to get to, through certain things that you don't like in order to get to the things that you do like. So um, that's just a general sort of philosophy or life philosophy that my wife and I were discussing last night. I thought it might be interesting to throw it out there uh, to see, you know, if you what you thought about it, or if you had any comments, not strictly related to the history, just uh, just sort of in a general aside. Okay, moving on to the next topic, um, we are uh, according you know according to our calendar and the general pace of things, we're moving through the interwar years, um, which essentially we're gonna we're gonna break down as the the gap between the end of World War One, which was supposed to be the war to end all wars, and you know, the beginning, middle end of World War II, which was only 20 years later. So it wasn't a big gap in time between the two. We know that wars have been handled, you know, wars have been waged throughout the history of the world. As soon as people, uh, you know, began to civilize, they began to fight. So, you know, conflict was never uh, really an unknown quantity in, civil, in any hab uh, uh, populated area. Um, society, civilization, anything like that. There was always war, but the real difference is that the, you know, the First World War brought the idea of a global fight into, into, the, into the world, into the lexicon. Before that, it tended to be local nations that were close to each other, battling along, you know, reasonably well-defined territory lines and, and, you know, taking territory and, and losing territory or capturing a city or losing a city. It tended to be relatively localized, but with the advent of, tech, uh, of traveling routes and ships and technology and whatnot, um, it brought the globe into play. Okay, now we're fighting in the air. Now we've got tanks. Now we've got uh, machine guns that can just, you know, that, you know, open field fighting became, you know, not, certainly less successful than it had been in the past because machine guns can just wipe out an entire plane of people and animals. So, you, you know, you're starting to look at things like tanks and armor and trenches. And the old type, uh, the old battlements that the old days would protect against trebuchets and, and the odd cannon. Well, now with howitzers that you can fire from a mile away, they don't really work anymore. So, you know, with, with all of these advances in warfare and training and weaponry and, and, uh, and um, the ability to travel and communicate with people at a distance turned it into a global conflict. What essentially started out as some Austro-Hungarian um, royalty slash nobility slash leadership not particularly appreciating the fact that Serbia was anti-Austrian at the time, and uh, even though it was a small country, ca causing some problems. What began as a relatively localized and small conflict turned into a war that killed, um, you know, over 10 million people and affected, uh, infected, the, affected the lives of, of tens of millions more, and involved you know, nation, huge nations that had never, uh, you know, that had never experienced a war to that extent or that level of, of, um, of uh, sorry, I'm looking for casualty. 
And everybody thought it was going to be a short war. Everybody, you know, the, the popular line, whether you were British or German or, or French or, or Russian or Austro-Hungarian, was this war will be over by, by, by Christmas. It was going to be a four or five month engagement. Everybody thought they had a plan to win. And as we found out, things had changed so much. And every military mind in the entire group um, realized very quickly that the nature of warfare had changed and that this was in fact, in fact going to be a long and drawn out war where millions and millions and millions of people died. And that's what happened. And there's lots of argument out there as to whether or not it really was a necessary war. Um, did anybody end up better off after the war? Did it actually accomplish anything aside from killing millions of people? And we've got some videos and one of the videos, YouTube interesting videos for that uh, uh, documentary by Sir David Hastings, which is the basis for the assignment 1.1.3. I thought it was a very interesting look. It's definitely very British. It's very much from a British perspective. And I think they maybe overstate the importance of British military, British politicians, British mind in it, which is, you know, somewhat to be expected from a BBC documentary. So they may have overstated Britain's importance, uh, but it definitely made some good points about, uh, you know, did, were we any better off? Was it necessary? Um, who was responsible? Uh, it's very, it's, you know, it's quite anti-German, <laughs> um, but, you know, you got you to consider all perspectives, and that's one of them, and I think it's quite an interesting piece. So I'm enjoying looking through those assignments from uh, from uh, 1.1, 1.3. Um, but uh, anyway, so the, the, the nature of warfare has changed. And, and the last live session did we, uh, you know, I went through some maps and we discussed the, the Schlieffen plan and how, how Germany knew they had to get France out of the war quickly. So they, they took a route and they were, they were, you know, the German military leadership, uh, Molte was very, very ad adamant that this conflict needs to happen. And that uh, in order for it to happen, we can't take, I'll just go to a map and make it a little easier to demonstrate, even though we have gone through some of this before. Just gonna find a map to see the, see the countries on. Just a second here. There, this is something with well-defined boundaries. Show the screen a little bit. I don't want to rehash too much ground here, but uh, but this is a relatively important review. All right, so this is Western Europe, and these are these are more or less the pre-war boundaries. Uh, you can see the Central Powers: Germany and Austria, Hungary. Obviously, um, they have they have coast, but they're but they're attached by a land. Russia in the east, France on the west. Um, Austria starts the, essentially start the ball rolling. Um, problems with Serbia, uh, Archduke Ferdinand, which who is the presumptive heir or who is going to be the next king of likely or chancellor of Austria, Germany, and his wife are killed in Sarajevo. So in Serbia, uh, there's, a, there's definitely conflict. There's uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina. There's lots of talk about, about uh, Serbia's right to be a sovereign nation and not be you know sort of controlled by austria or you know they were very close political contacts with russia but they still had essentially their their own nation their own sovereignty russia uh, austria hungary there's conflict both before uh, the assassination obviously and after and we, we've gone through all the potential causes and whatnot um, but that conflict uh, basically explodes austria makes demands of serbia serbia um, doesn't agree to a couple of the key ones austria despite Germany originally saying and, and, and saying, you know, we're your ally, but don't go to war. It's probably not a good idea or whatnot. Um, Austria declares war on Serbia. The alliances have been formed. The alliance, uh, Germany and Austria, very strong alliance at the, initial, at the, at the beginning of, uh, you know, sort of in the early 1914, um, before the war starts. Russia and France, also a very strong alliance. England kind of a bit on the outside. Um, they wanted to stay neutral because they didn't really have a big army. They still had naval supremacy, but they didn't really have a big army. They had a well-trained army, but not a very big one. They would have preferred to stay out of the war if they could. So France and Russia were kind of like, we need to do this. We need to defend ourselves. We need to make sure that Germany doesn't take over Western Europe. Um, everybody was more concerned about Germany than they were about Austria-Hungaria. That's for sure. 
Um, but England would have rather, I think, sat that one out, but they eventually found that they just couldn't. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So at the beginning of the war, the Germans need to, 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 to isolate France. They need to take France quickly because they did not want to get into a situation where there was a long battle on the Western Front and there was also a long battle on the Eastern Front because Russia may have been a little bit technologically inferior, but they had millions and millions of people, um, much more certainly than Germany and Austria could provide for the war. So the goal was to get the French out early and then you only have to about fighting, worry about fighting the war on the East Coast instead of, or on the East side instead of on both sides. Um, Austria in a similar mode, uh, they, they knew they needed to take these, uh, what would become Yugoslavia after the war, they needed to take Serbia and Albania and Romania and whatnot, and still managed to remain on good terms with what was referred to as the Ottoman people or Ottoman Empire, which just, just think about it as Turkey right now. So this is Turkey over here. You'll notice they're sort of aligned in color, Turkey and Bulgaria, um, with the alliance of Germany, and they were in effect allied, um, but Turkey didn't really join them the main fighting until a little bit later. So Germany tries to get uh, tries to get into France going through Belgium, which was a neutral nation, and tried to remain neutral instead of fighting along this big border, this big border between Germany and France. Uh, France or Germany figures that that's going to be too well defended. That's the most natural place to attack. Let's go through a neutral nation and surprise them. The Schlieffen plan: go through Belgium from the north, sweep down into Paris. As soon as we beat Paris. We've got the, you know, the nations, the heart of the nation, the capital, we've got that. And then we can sort of spread our powers out and control the coasts and do all those things that we need to do with France to ensure that we're not going to be fighting France the entire war. They got off to a good start, but they, you know, the, the, the idea of, of going through Belgium, Belgium point blank told them that no, we're not allowing this. Belgium does not have the military force um, required to stop Germany from doing anything. And um, there were... I mean, all war is, is horrible. All war is awful. There's tragedy. There's uh, there's there's casualty. War is bad. I mean, we know this. Um, but there were certain atrocities committed by German soldiers going through Belgium that got the attention of the world and really, really put pressure on um, on the on the Entente and you know did quite a bit in in terms of convincing England that and Britain, sorry, at this time that they needed to be part of the war. Um, you know executing citizens, women, children, um, sort of breaking the, the generally accepted rules of war uh, for the time. And, uh, it, you know, a, a, big, a big light was shed on what was happening in this area as the war was just get, getting going. And, you know, the same sort of thing happened, um, happened down here in Serbia and, uh, and to some extent in, uh, in pieces of Russia. So, you know, this is, the, the world's a smaller place now. Um, there's news wires. You know, telephone information flows more, and, and that certainly the atrocities in Belgium during the Schlieffen Plan um, very, very negatively impacted the opinion, the global opinion of, of, of Germany and and their allies in this war. So Germany makes a really good initial offensive, gets pretty close to Paris, um, essentially gets kind of stopped just in time by the French army, who are you know learning very quickly uh, that the old days of battle are over. Um, wearing blue uniforms and marching across open fields, loading, manually loading guns, taking one shot every 20 seconds, that is not going to work. Um, cavalry, riding horses into battle across open fields. Uh, methods of warfare that had worked for hundreds if not thousands of years were no longer effective. Germans had machine guns. They didn't really need uh, to spend much time reloading. They could just fire machine guns across the plane and kill anything in sight. And uh, it took France uh, it took France quite a while to sort of understand that this is the nature of war now and that technology had changed things completely. Now they had you know huge cannons called howitzers that could shoot uh, that could shoot explosive projectiles uh, projectiles miles and miles and miles things that had never happened before. Um, although not a big factor right at the beginning of the war, um, you know planes bringing aerial warfare and Hindenburgs and things like that. Uh, uh, not Zeppelin, sorry, not Hindenburg, that's a, a, a Zeppelin, uh, bringing, bringing Zeppelins in, um, large, you know, floating um, blimps, essentially, except they used hydrogen instead of uh, helium, uh, and, and <clears throat> armored ships, submarines, things like that, things that really hadn't existed before, changed the, changed the nature of warfare significantly. France was a little slow to pick up that, but 
They stopped the German advance in time, pushed them back over the Ein and the Marne, and then they dug in. And now trench warfare starts, which is also a new thing. It's easy to shoot somebody on the plane if they're hiding in a foxhole, if they're hiding in a trench, much more difficult to, uh, to, to, to kill that person. And then between the trenches became sort of what was called no man's land, lots of mines, barbed wire. Um, every once in a while, army would go, quote, over the top, and they would try to make an offensive, and sometimes they were successful and took over the other trenches and, and uh, battlements, and sometimes they were unsuccessful. And, and, you know, this would go back and forth, and wars and battles that were typically, you know, lasted a couple days in, in years past or, or decades or hundreds of years past. Because of trenches, now prolonged warfare could, could essentially be going 24-7 for weeks and weeks at a time. And, and so that slows the battle down, increases the casualty rate, and decreases the amount of movement that armies can make in a given period of time. Again, totally different than warfare had been. So there's a, basically a standstill up here, and Germany gets exactly what they don't want. Now they're, they're dug in for battle in, in, uh, in northern France. And there are also a lot of battles going along, uh, going on in uh, on the, uh, the Russian-German side, the Eastern Bloc. Austria-Hungary's um, doing a lot of fighting down here, and also trying to support um, uh, support uh, initiatives up here. Up here, Italy has tried to remain neutral uh, during this period of time. It wouldn't actually officially join uh, the alliance, the Atom, until later. Um, and the U.S. the same thing. U.S. really wanted to remain a neutral and impartial. They had reasonably strong political and economic ties to Germany. At the time, the Germans were probably number one in the world with regard to technology and advancing technology and making things more efficient, and whether it came to farming and, and you know, using machinery and developing. The U.S., if not as good, was, you know, was, was in the same ballpark. And they didn't really want to get involved with this conflict that was more than half a world away. Essentially, they were drawn in um, through, through many factors, one of which was the sinking of the Lusitania, which was, a, which was an American passenger ship that was gunned down by, by a U-boat. There were other, you know, there were other economic and political reasons for the U.S. to join the fight, which essentially turned the tide in World War I. It was a huge, huge deal when the U.S. Um, started to bring troops in and, and you know, the Canadians had, 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 and other uh, Allied nations were, were certainly uh, a big piece of the puzzle too, but um, the Americans didn't want to be part of the battle and ended up being coming to the par uh, part of the battle, one of the many sort of mistakes that Germany made along the way. Um, but I guess the point I was trying to make there is that the, the, that, uh, the warfare was different. Um, Germany ended up fighting on too many fronts. Uh, Russia uh, developed and brought their army along it was probably underdeveloped at the beginning of the war. In fact, it definitely was with regard to technology, but they had lots and lots of manpower. Uh, they, they ended up ex suffering extreme casualties, but Russia more or less um, held the line there and, and they pushed into German territory for a while and the Germans pushed back. And at the end of the war, at the end of the war, again, there were turning points, you've read about them, they're in the course material. So at the end of the war, um, Germany couldn't, do what they needed to do so that the the uh, even though they had support from turkey and the ottoman empire later uh, wasn't were not successful and um america coming into the war and woodrow wilson the president at the time um certainly had had an impact there um but uh the the you know the the, the central powers were dismantled and uh but the world realized at the end of world war one that that war uh, was different than anything anybody had ever seen before. And the primary concern on the minds of everybody involved was, uh, except for Germany, was we can't ever let Germany do that again. So at the time, the prevailing opinion, which again is always going to be crafted by the, by the group or groups that won the war. I mean, they kind of, you know, they tend to influence uh, history or the recording of history or the oral tradition of history uh, more than the losers do. Um, but there were, you know, there was a, there was a group of, of four powers. Um, Woodrow Wilson actually, I think, kind of spearheaded it, was the U.S. president. Um, so it, it had the, uh, the United States, Great Britain, France, and Italy. I believe it was the big four. And Russia had their own problems at this point. There was a Bolshevik revolution going on in, starting in 1917 in Russia. 
Russia was extremely politically unstable and, and there was, you know, dictatorship and totalitarian, totalitarianism uh, reaching, uh, uh, influencing the political environment over there. So Russia was kind of out of this just, they had their own thing going on. It was very, <laughs> it was a very big deal in Russia. Red October, Red October. Um, but so these, these, the four powers basically came together and the general idea between Britain, France, Italy, and, and the US was that can't happen again. We can never let Germany have that kind of power again. And we really need to, Germany needs to be punished um, as part of this so that they never ever, A, they help pay for the, for, for the damage caused and B, uh, that this never ever happens again. And though that might sound reasonable if you're on the winning side, uh, what it really did was just make World War II um, not only possible, but imminent. So these four powers, um, I think it's generally in history referred to as the four powers, um, came, uh, came it, it had, had talks uh, regarding, you know, just this here, we, we get through the war. And don't forget, like the war was fought also in places like Africa. There was a lot of naval warfare. Um, the British and Germans conducted extreme amounts of, of naval warfare. In fact, here's a good idea. Um, the Germans were always trying to get their, their supply ships to the other side of France so that they could resupply on the shores of, of land that they had taken and whatnot. And Britain's Navy was very, was very strong. So there was tons of naval battles. Uh, German U-boats, those are the submarines versus big uh, dreadnought armor-sided ships from Britain. And, and uh, so there's a lot of naval battles. There was fighting in Africa. There was fighting down uh, in Turkey. Uh, there was there was conflict in Asia, China, Japan. You know, it what really was a, a world war, and often those areas aren't paid as much attention to, to Central Europe, where the where the main conflict was. But just just so you're aware of it, um, fighting wasn't just in um, you know in the areas that we've been talking about in France, in in Germany, in Austria, Hungary, Serbia, and, and Russia. It was there were there were many many more areas that had conflict depending on which alliance the 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 that country was was uh, was part of. Uh, so what I was going to show you was <laughs> this is when I said the Bolshevik re uh, revolution. This is what I'm talking about in Russia. And we're going to get into that a bit more in, in, an, in an interwar era as we discuss um, uh, totalitarianism, uh, nationalism, basically foundations of Nazi party, Nazi national socialism in Germany but also uh, experiments in Russia with, uh, with revolution and dictatorship and things like that in Italy. So this was starting to happen in, in Russia here towards the end of uh, uh, 1917. Um, people revolting and political structure and economic structure totally changing in Russia. So Russia was very, very uh, busy with that. And uh, similar things happened in Italy actually with Benito Mussolini starting very quickly after World War I as well. And, uh, and there was a, you know, there was there was a dictatorship in, in or fascist dictatorship in Italy very shortly. Sorry, I thought I had something about the uh, I thought I had something here about the four nations uh, or four powers. Just give me a second here. I just want to. Lost my page here. Sorry, I had a really good page. I can't find it right now, but I will. I will get to it. Okay. Well, at the end of at the end of World War One, I'll just kind of go back to the to the. 
the general idea. Um, toward the end of World War I, uh, at the end of the day, the, the, the nations involved didn't really change their borders all that much, but it did end up to the formation of several new, uh, several new countries. But as far as land um, sort of captured or, or, or surrendered, not really a whole lot changed. I mean, France's borders were the same, Britain's borders were the same. Um, some change had been made in, you know, places in Africa and colonial, uh, you know, places that were there from, from uh, colonization much, much earlier. Um, but the, the major changes, I would say, were closer to Russia. And remember, Russia's going through uh, a significant political crisis at this time. Russia's going through significant political crisis at the time, um, but definitely land that Germany had taken, particularly on this eastern end. A lot of that did go back towards Slavic, Slavic being Bal and Baltic, you know, like Russia, Bulgaria, Poland, Ukraine, that's uh, people from that area. Um, the borders and boundaries did change there. They did not change much on the west side, if at all. Uh, but there is now uh, uh, the idea of the uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, Soviet Union breaking up into a union of sort of semi-independent nations. And, uh, and a some of these were, a lot of these kind of were still around during my era, and some are still here today. But there's countries like, uh, like Yugoslavia um, was a country when I was growing up, and it was really the, it was really the formation of, of several different smaller countries, which have now been broken up again. And, uh, but, you know, things like that, you know, Yugoslavia was, was recognized, Austria and Hungary were now recognized as two separate countries rather than austria Hungary. Uh, you know, Serbia, Herze uh, Bosnia, Herze Herzegovina, uh, oh, there's another couple in there. They, they, they were all considered part of Yugoslavia and Czechoslovakia uh, as well, Poland, Lithuania, Latvia, you can see them all the way up top, the places that were former just either Russian or Austro-Hungarian are now being, you know, broken up into these into these well-defined. You call them independent nations, but there were certainly a lot of political ties with uh, with the big powers that were around them. Um, but in general, I mean, a, a, most of the the land uh, boundaries didn't didn't shift all that much for either the victors or the losers, and everybody was out, mil, uh, you know, billions and billions and billions of dollars from fighting the war, and millions and millions, you know, tens ten plus million people. Uh, were dead. So you, you, even if you won the war, you didn't win. I mean, you were essentially, you know, you were, your economy was running strong while you were building things for the war. And um, wartime economies tend to produce money. And the U.S., you know, is a pretty strong example of that. They've got the best military in the world. And a, and a, and a huge portion of their economy and their, uh, and their government budget goes to military mobilization, the trillions and trillions of dollars. Uh, that's the same for, for any nation. Um, your military, when you're when you're producing for a military, your economy is going full speed ahead. It tends to be relatively strong. But after the war is over, um, all those people that were mobilized in, in building things for the war, you know, building tanks, building munitions, building this, that, and the other, they were gainfully employed. Now they're no longer have a job, and and things tend to kind of go south. Now, if you're a winner in the war, um, you know, you've got national pride. Um, Particularly in the states, a uh, period of time uh, known as the, the, the Roaring Twenties after World War II, where where the economy was expanding and stock market was flourishing and people were happy and there was money and whatnot. And then, if you're a student of history, you know that stock market crashed in late 1929, I think it was, and things went very downhill very quickly. Economic collapse, along with like of the stock market and, and corporate ownership, combined with the worst drought. And growing conditions that the, the West had ever seen, and now you got the dirty 30s, you got the Great Depression, where it's just the opposite, where people are, you know, people are really uh, struggling again, financially uh, are struggling, and and uh, you know, this that, that's in the West where we are, you know, Canada, the U.S., etc. Uh, but similar things happened in in uh, in Europe after the war. So where was I? I was talking about the uh, the four nations, talk about about um, the idea that. Essentially, Germany was blamed for the entire thing, and uh, you know, I'm not saying that's fair. I'm just saying that generally the the thinking of it and the idea was to try to make sure that this didn't happen again. So this evolved into uh, the war ended. Germany was looking for an armistice, which essentially just a fighting, a ceasing of the hostilities, 
a ceasefire, you know, war is over. And the official end would, would come in the form of, um, of uh, the Treaty of Versailles. And the Treaty of Versailles is based on 14 points that Woodrow Wilson from the U.S. brought over. And <clears throat> essentially, they were, these are the things that have to happen for us to all consider that this conflict is done with and for us to pull all our forces and all our military effort out and for us to, uh, you know, to, to, to continue on. And the points were devastating for Germany. There was a lot of land that had been, um, you know, that was Germany's either before the war or had been captured. And it was, it was required to be, uh, to be, you know, just redistributed back or, or taken away from Germany. Germany was given severe financial um, uh, penalties call them reparations. So, I mean, the idea was, is because Germany lost the war, because Germany was deemed to be the main, um, the main, uh, the cause of the war or the, or the, or the antagonist that countries had lost billions and billions and billions of dollars over it. Germany's responsible. They should have to pay the bill for the war. Anybody with half a brain could see that that was going to be completely impossible. There was no way that Germany could afford to pay for all of the, all of the war damage, damage to economies, damage to land uh, penalties. It wasn't going to happen, but really it did. Uh, it did bankrupt Germany essentially and it caused the extreme hyperinflation in their economies and and uh, yeah, like really, really punitive to Germany. And when something like that happens, who suffers? The regular, you know, common folks suffer. And these really, I don't know if you've heard the word draconian before, but it's, you know, really severe, probably over, overly severe. All of these, all of these um, uh, requirements uh, with regard to the Treaty of Versailles and the League of Nations, the League of Nations is like the, the uh, the, 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 basically the Allied nations uh, uh, were represented and, and formed this, you know, large political, global political organization. And they were essentially, um, I guess you'd consider the United Nations at the time. <clears throat> um, Germany was basically had these imposed upon them. I mean, they had to agree with them. Otherwise, military uh, offensive would continue and Germany would definitely lose. They had already lost the war. They were in no position to say no to anything, but they were really just forced to accept that these are the penalties uh, that, that we're going to have to suffer. And they were very harsh. And what they did is they destroyed a lot of German um, economy and political structure and stability. And when that happens, again, the people that suffer are, are the people at the bottom. And this is one of the reasons that the end of World War One and the and the Treaty of Versailles and the and the acts that the League of Nations imposed upon Germany really just ensured that there was going to be a second major conflict. Because what happened was there was a great anti-German sense in Europe and in, in the people of German, uh, Prussian people, people that had, you know that are part of that sort of uh, culture and area, um, really felt that they had been dealt a, a horrible blow. Not only had they lost the war and, you know, billion, and millions of people killed and billions and billions and billions of dollars spent, now they're going to completely, you know, push us into uh, financial ruin. So it, 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 there's unrest in the German population. And although things would stabilize uh, over the 20s and into the 30s, there's still a very, very strong um, undercurrent in German society that essentially we got screwed over at the end of, of World War I. And that rising um, public, I don't know what you call it, uh, not anguish, but, but uh, it was unrest. It was, you know, maybe thinly veiled anger and, uh, and uh, people weren't happy. And, I, and you know, it's, it's pretty widely believed that that subcurrent of, of the way that German people had been living and had been treated post-World War I led to um, the rise of national social, socialism and Hitler and, and uh, you know, these, these very strongly focused totalitarian um, ideas and nationalistic ideas. Um, whereas if maybe if the, if the punishments after World War I were not quite as, you know, were a bit more sort of fair or, or, or 
levied in a way that would help resolve conflict in the area instead of just punishing, uh, maybe that sentiment wouldn't have been as strong. Maybe the, nation, uh, the, the National Socialist Party and Hitler don't get as much power, um, don't have as much backing. Maybe World War II doesn't happen. But you know what? Who knows? It, it, you know, it's easier to say. It's easy to say that looking back. Um, if not that particular World War, maybe it would have happened somewhere else. If you watch the Hastings video, you know that um, that it's, it's strongly his opinion and uh, of uh, the opinion of others who he's talked to that um, whether or not the war was necessary, it was likely going to occur. Had all the things with Austria-Hungary and Serbia and Franz Ferdinand not happened and toppled in the right way in order to just trigger the war, um, something else would have. Uh, he, he's a very strong, uh, a very strong belief, and, and and has evidence to you know sort of support his opinion that um, Germany was becoming a real problem in Europe, um, m mostly because of the way that they were advancing their society and the efficiency in which they were uh, they were um, advancing their 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 you know technology and the industrial revolution and whatnot, and uh, there was an increasing sense of. Of, uh, of, of worry that Germany was going to become a very, very big power in the middle of a very densely populated with regard to nations around an area, and that, that at some point military conflict was going to occur anyway. So it was of their opinion that it was going to happen regardless, um, but it, you know, it ended up happening the way it happened. So we'll, I'll, I'll get into it maybe a bit more detail the next time on the, on the interwar and the beginning of World War II, but it is important that you they have a reasonable idea as to um, what happened right at the end of the war, um, and, and you know, make, develop your own opinion on whether or not the the terms of the you know Treaty of Versailles and the 14 points were acceptable, were fair, were unfair, and what caused uh, or sort of what effect um, the post-war political and economic sentiment. How did that affect the way things were in Western Europe? And how did we ever get to a point, let alone only 20 years later, um, whereby the entire world was thrust, into, uh, was thrust into war again in World War II? So just be thinking about those things, about what's going on in the interwar period and how you know it's almost ironic that the world the war that was supposed to end all wars and and prove once you know prove once and for all for everybody that this was something that just can't happen. It's too destructive. It's too you know it's too expensive. Um, not only did that not turn out being true, but it, what happened directly after the war pretty much assured that there was going to be some major military um, and political strife. In the in the 1930s, leading up until World War II, so that's that's just you know something to think about, and maybe we'll go into a bit more detail on Friday. So I'll leave it there today. Uh, are there any are there any questions or any concerns? Anything I can help you out with right now? Okay. From the chat window, it sounds like uh, things are all right, and I will just continue to um, let you know that I'm here to help. So if you've got a question, send me an email, um, come to a live session, just uh, reach out to me in some way and I'd be happy to do my best to help you out. If you feel like you're a bit behind, uh, again, time to maybe sit down and, and, uh, and uh, discuss with people close to you what your goals are and uh, determine a plan to either help yourself get caught up or make alternative plans. Um, uh, but now is the time to adjust uh, and, and now is the time to make a decision about uh, about how are you going to proceed for the rest of the quarter and whatever your decision, I will support you in it. I just want to make sure that I do my best to help you reach your goals. So have a nice day. And one more thing, um, I, I want to make sure that we're using these live sessions to the best of our my ability to help you with what you feel like would be um, the, the most efficient and effective way for, for you to reach your goals. So um, the live sessions in general have not been well attended, and I have put out a survey asking if we should somehow adapt how we use this time. And, I, and there's several ideas in there, including me just blocking off time that I can meet with students one-on-one uh, -on -one in synchronous, like live session, just uh, in a subgroup to go over a specific question or a specific concept or a specific assignment or something like that. If that's something that students feel is, uh, is maybe be a better use of our uh, synchronous time each week, 
or even for just one of the two sessions, I'm certainly on board with that. So in the announcement section, I put a link to a post, uh, to, a, to a survey, very quick, 20 seconds, you'll be done. So please do take the time, go fill out that survey. Um, it's got some potential options. It's also got a place where you can say a other, you know, like maybe there's something I never didn't think of that uh, is a brilliant idea. Um, so please, please do have a look at that and give me some input so that we can just make sure that we're using this live synchronous time uh, to the best of our ability. Because it's not been well attended, I find myself kind of, uh, kind of lecturing and reviewing things uh, in the course. And, and if that's not effective, I don't like listening to myself talk for an hour. So um, that's probably not the most effective use of this. And I want it to be effective and useful for you. So help me by giving me some feedback. And then we'll uh, we'll make the adjustments we need to. So thanks again. Stay in touch and take care.